Willkommen in der Kolonie, Baby! Gothic 2 and its expansion Night of the Raven is unanimously praised as the pinnacle of the series and I couldn't agree more. It has better gameplay, more quests, more build variety. Everything is the same, but also better, more polished. I lived under this assumption for quite a while, until I made this channel and had to analyze the game for my content. The revelation was kind of shocking to me. Gothic 1 had a superior story, better music, a stronger atmosphere, and its themes were way more defining. Today I want to talk about these themes, and how they made the first game so unique, and how they got lost over time. Without any further delay, let's get to it. The whole reason why Gothic happens is the magical ore. The stage is set with the intro cinematic. The king needs a special kind of ore to win the war against the orcs. The mineral is crucial to win this fight, its properties are beyond anything that normal ore could do. Any army equipped with weapons and armor forged from it has vast advantages over their enemies. To reinforce the king's mining operation on the island of Carinus, a magic barrier is summoned by the mightiest mages of the realm to prevent anyone from escaping, encapsulating a whole valley. Gothic's overworld is breathtaking, and it has become a very iconic place, but I think that its dungeons don't get enough credit. The old mine is the heart of the colony. And the old camp is the main artery that pumps the ore straight into the industrial machine that fuels the war. The kingdom depends on its yield, its importance can't be stressed enough. Its massive shafts reach far down, so far indeed that the diggers dug deep into minecrawler territory, reaching their nest. It is here where the Templars hunt the creatures for their secretion on a daily basis, and down below, we find the queen's eggs containing the most potent concentrate which is necessary for the invocation of the sleeper. The new camp's mining operations are no less impressive. While their main dig is massive in its own right, they also win ore on the surface. After fighting our way through the tunnels, killing crawler warriors and Gomez invading forces on our way, we finally find Tarok the enslaved orc who assists us in crafting the Ulumulu, which is the key for the sleeper's lair. Both mines are similar, but their purpose couldn't be any different. While the old camp mines ore to stay in power, the new camp wins the mineral to break out of the prison. But there are more places deep within the earth, which are equally important for the lore, but also for the game's atmosphere. The first time we come in contact with the orcs is after the invocation of the sleeper. Trying to make sense of the vision the slumbering god granted its followers, Korongar sends the hero into a nearby place called the Orc Graveyard. The damp tunnels are teeming with orcs, and the alcoves are the last resting place of their ancestors, mummified, rotten, and slowly withering away. In dark halls, the last remnants of the Brotherhood's expedition are fighting for their lives, in search for a way into freedom. During the final chapters, the hero ventures into the depths of the southwestern mountains, uncovering the ancient secrets which lie in the Temple of the Sleeper. Massive underground structures and abyssal chasms put even the old mine to shame. As you can see, there are quite a lot of those underground places, and I think they contributed greatly to the game's atmosphere. These dungeons defined Gothic in a way that's very unique. It is also noteworthy that inside these underground places we achieve great milestones which are essential to progress the story. The following entries in the franchise, when it comes to this aspect, are but a shadow compared to the first game. 
Gothic 2 has a few caves, but no real dungeons. And Urderoth is just a very short, very linear experience, hardly comparable to the finale of Gothic 1, and at this point we don't even need to talk about the third installment. The significance of those deep places and their contribution to the atmosphere can't be emphasized enough, and it makes me sad that we never got such a dark experience in the following titles. While forests and meadows are a nice change of scenery, a part of Gothic's identity got lost in the process. While the old camp and the new camp feel grounded in a way, the Brotherhood of the Sleeper, derogatively called the Sect, stands out for its practices and their way of life. Their mysterious aura being a counterbalance to the other settlements. The people inside the colony call them all different names. Lunatics, fanatics, and right from the start Diego paints a picture of them which isn't at all in their favor. Before ever meeting them our opinion is swayed in a certain direction, emphasizing their mystifying nature. Once we step into the old camp and talk to their emissaries, it becomes very clear that the inhabitants of the swamp are quite different from the remaining convicts. The Brotherhood renounces the gods of Morgrad. Beliar, Enos and even Adonis are swept from their spiritual consciousness, but we learn that they didn't give up on religion at all. The enigmatic sleeper is now central to their beliefs because he promises a way out of the barrier, a way into freedom. It sounds so strange listening to the emissaries in the old camp for the first time, but either way, our curiosity got the better of us. In the warm climate of the eastern edges of the colony, we arrive at the Brotherhood's gates and are overcome by the scenery. We make our way through the hazy air in the swamp, in the shadows of enormous trees, inhaling the sweet smell of swamp weed that is consumed here so vigorously. From the letter we ought to bring to the Magicians of Fire, we learn that the sect's mere presence stirs discomfort among the established powers. You could even sense a grain of fear in their words, and that is for a good reason. The slumbering god is so powerful that it delivers visions but also bestows powerful magic on his believers. A kind of magic that is novel and also rivals the spells of the established mages of the realm. This magic, however, is shrouded in mystery and the secrecy of the spiritual leaders, the gurus, doesn't help getting a clearer picture of the situation. The sheer fact that the worshippers need to enter an altered state of consciousness to connect to their deity is genuinely abstract. Their need for secretion from a subterranean insectoid to enhance that state even more so. Haunting rituals in the swamp, getting high on plants and animal liquids, Abstract tattoos covering their faces, ancient runes on their garments, weird arcane arts and their blind devotion makes them quite simply the most occult aspect of the game. Talking about occultism, we have to mention the orcs, their shamanism and veneration of the dead. Behind their brutish appearance and animalistic ferociousness lies a sophisticated and spiritual nature, but their ancient history was plagued with wars, conquest and loss. Venturing into their graveyard, we get a glimpse at what is to come. Dusty niches, hidden paths and altars where they sacrificed humans. Their defeat on Corinus eons ago left them desperate and they had to resort to dark and unholy magic to summon the mighty sleeper. The shamans who called the archdemon into the world paid the ultimate prize as he took their hearts and used them as an anchor to stay in this reality. The massive temple beneath the earth with all the mysteries that it holds 
is the height of their occult machinations, and it really does emphasize the dark fantasy aspect of the first game. Another example, not as big in scope but fairly notable, which dives into occultism, is the story of Chromanin and the Fog Tower. The cryptic meaning behind the book and the identity of the dead person we find at the end, never to be mentioned again, never explained. One can only speculate about what Chromanin is, but its true nature remains hidden. The stranger, possibly vanquished by the dark gathering of undead deep below in the mines under the tower, was maybe too close embracing the truth about these age-old tales of Chromanin. All of these things paint a very dark and ominous atmosphere which made Gothic 1 so uncommon. Unfortunately, this theme gradually vanished from the franchise, with Gothic 2 having very few moments which reminded me of that atmosphere. The Seekers are definitely an example for occultism, but they never had a real story in which we explored their backgrounds properly. Ilderoth can be mentioned as well, but it feels so rushed, unfinished and also random at times. The last chapter is a far cry from what we witnessed in the Sleeper Temple. Gothic 3 unfortunately has none of these themes, no cults, no dark rituals, no gloomy places, only a few small caves and eventually some tiny tombs we need to clear. As I said before, the world gradually became tamer, more standard and less unique. And this I am going to use as a segue into the next chapter. A valley encompassed by a massive magical dome. A mighty fortress surrounded by slums and protected by a tall makeshift palisade. An enormous cave with an ore heap in its center. Massive trees rising from the swamp and the temple above a gigantic abyss, its architecture too foreign to understand. The world of Gothic 1 is truly strange and the locations reiterate this perfectly. To underline this point, let's compare. Have a look at Carinus, which is basically the main hub in Gothic 2. Vaguely resembling the Romanesque style, half timber houses in the upper and the craftsman quarter, and a poverty stricken harbor with simple shacks made out of wood. While the style is kind of coherent, we can clearly see that this city is inspired by the real world, but its counterpart in the Valley of Mines, the Old Camp, is way more distinct in its look and feel. A massive fortress of black stone, towering over slums, broken down shacks and surrounded by a bulwark made out of wood. The headquarters of the mercenaries, while being basically the same group of people, their homes in both games couldn't be any different. Ona's farm looks like it's taken straight out of the 13th or 14th century Europe. Half timber houses like in Carinus and in general a very realistic approach to a large scale peasant farm. Gothic 1 however gives us this. A huge cavern open to one side, filled with dwellings in the adobe style, made of clay and insulated with straw. This style can be found in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and it is a completely uncommon sight for a medieval fantasy. And again we are venturing into the swamps, home of the Brotherhood. With its architecture clearly inspired by indigenous tribes, it definitely doesn't fit with a typical medieval setting. Small details like their take on torches is also enhancing this otherworldly feel. Instead of bland torches illuminating the swampy haze by fire, they use the magical ore, glowing with a blue hue. 
If you compare the final dungeons of Gothic 1 and 2, it becomes even more apparent that they lost this key ingredient. Ilderoth doesn't feel unique, and the fact that it's so linear doesn't help. It is supposed to be a temple of Beliar, but all we find is human architecture. The most interesting room is the antechamber before the last boss, but that is sadly relative. The Sleeper Temple's architecture is clearly non-human, and when you come to the point that you reach the bridge before the sanctuary, this whole thing doesn't feel right. Like it should not be here. You think of your journey, you saw castles and ruins, traversed swamps and mountains, and now this? You feel like you traversed dimensions carried by those ominous and ethereal sounds of a synthesizer. But you are still here, where you started, in the Valley of Mines. These things on their own aren't really noteworthy, but it is the composition, the mixture of all these things that add this otherworldly ambience to Gothic. Comparing Gothic 2 and 3 to the first game, they seem tame and the fantasy became bland in a lot of ways. A lot more medieval everyday life as can be seen in Corinna's, more political struggles like the situation between the paladins and Onar's farm, and the struggle on the mainland with orcs occupying most cities and rebels hiding in forests or holes in the ground. Expanding on themes in the Gothic universe is a fine thing, and that is why I like the Chronicles of Matana so much. It is not the typical Chosen One storyline, but rather about petty politics in the face of a war that is about to devour mankind. Adding these things, however, shouldn't come at the cost of established themes, the ones that are responsible for creating such a unique ambience that so strongly define what Gothic was meant to be. I hope you liked my take on this matter. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one. And may the sleeper awaken.